to welcome to the stage, please, uh, Dr. Gerd Graus, uh, who is the Education Director for Kidsania. And he's here because I've spoken to him earlier. Thank you. Good morning. Just about. He's still awake. That'd be good. That'd be really good. Now let's see whether I can work the technology. There we are. Um, I'll try and be brief and I'll try and explain what we do. Um, my view is really simple that whatever we do in terms of apprenticeships and whatever we do with 19 and 16 year olds, it's 10 years too late. It's really easy. So that's me done. It's been nice meeting you. Um, Children can only aspire to what they know exists. Just hang on to that. Um, and then think that through what happens to you when you're 16 and somebody says, oh, by the way, you could do that as well. My point then is, shouldn't they have been made aware of that 10 years earlier to kind of calculate that in and become used to that? And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And the kind of building a creative approach to social mobility, will come to that in a minute. My granddad was my favorite person when I was a child. And he died when I was 12, he was a coal miner in the south of Holland. And uh, so one of those people who went underground when he was 14 and he resurfaced when he was 66 and there wasn't much left. Lungs, arthritis, all those bits. And I have one of those memories uh, that stick. It was a very sunny day, the front door was uh, brown, the kitchen chair was blue, his corduroy trousers were brown as well, and he had his flat cap on. I was nine years old and I sat on his knee. And he said to me, promise me you will always do your best at school. He didn't say, promise me you will get five A stars to see in the EBAC. And so when you're nine, you're programmed to ask why, because that's kind of in your job description. So I said, why? And his answer was, because I don't want you to have hands like mine. I don't. So that's my social mobility dealt with. And I think what we need to think about is we need to think about the language we use. Social mobility is not about people going to university. Social mobility is about appropriateness and tomorrow being slightly better than today. Yeah? And if you get a chance to read a book called Fearless, which is about Leicester City Football Club, I was stuck on a flight and I started reading it thinking, here we go. And actually it's incredibly interesting because what they're saying is, they put a significant part of their success down to knowing the individual and knowing what tailored program is appropriate for them. Think that through. And then think of our education system, which essentially boxes kids in and passes the parcel. And the recipient will always say, well, it isn't quite good enough. So if everybody got off the fence and rolled their sleeves up a bit, we might kind of get there. When I was a school child, I was directing my school play. It's not a job, it's a calling. A Romeo, a Romeo. They see surgery as an art form. It's a right to keep a cool head. Scalpel? I'm a bit of a petrol head. I could have been a doctor, but I prefer cars. What's not to love? And we're locked in three, two, one. Good morning. And welcome to the Nine Clock News. Kidsania, London. A city made just for kids aged 4 to 14. So that's what I do. To, I, I, I watch kids do jobs for about 20 minutes. And it's kind of quite cool. So very quickly, for those who don't know, we're kind of quite big. We, we do from inspiration to aspiration. We provide learning opportunities rather than teach children. We do allow them to prepare themselves and then follow up. Um, and we're 4 to 14. We're part of a global franchise. Uh, there are 24 globally. I now do the education piece globally. There will be 50. We're about to open in the States. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the research. We're also setting up a foundation, uh, which I am extraordinarily proud of, because I'm also very proud to say that out of all the school children that we have welcomed since we opened in 2015, 60% of those come from the 40% most deprived schools 
in the country. That was the aim. That's been achieved. I think we can do better, but it was a pretty decent start. So it's national, and it kind of has that coverage. Um, what can the kids do? They can choose. Yeah, you can land an aeroplane, you can write the front page of a newspaper, and they're your choices. The most important bit is, when we do evaluative pieces, where grown-ups are there to be seen and not heard. We're getting in the way. And there's a marked difference between Monday to Friday and Saturday and Sunday. Because Monday to Friday, the teachers get it, and they kind of go, the youngsters are prepared, and they go, I'm having my coffee over there, you can come and find me, off you go. And you can operate and you can land aeroplanes and you can be cabin crew, you all those things. The one thing that every activity has is a tangible outcome. So you go home with a sack full of memories where you can show and tell. Our education system is not about a sense of achievement. Our education system is about a sense of attainment. And if you're not very good at that bit, you can't do show and tell. Easy. So we, we need to make that happen, basically. You come on a Saturday and a Sunday, and the children have no choice, because the parents go, I don't want you to work in the supermarket, I want you to land aeroplanes. So I much prefer Monday to Friday on that front. What we try to do with schools is we try to bridge that gap. Because when a child understands why you do something, you get a far greater sense of achievement, probably of attainment at some point or other, but you certainly get the buy-in. Talking to three girls, do you like English at school? Not very much. Why not? Well, I hate writing in particular because they tell us what to do and everything is marked in red, blah, blah. You can picture it, can't you? We've all been there. They're sitting outside the newspaper, which is partnered with Metro. So I'm kind of saying, did you like the newspaper? It's brilliant, you can get to do it together, you can correct your own mistakes, you take the front page away, it's got a purpose, and all of a sudden you kind of have bridged that gap. Maybe we need to think about doing that at a much earlier age. Maybe we need to think about careers awareness or futures awareness long before we talk about careers education. Yeah? When I once mentioned not that long ago that I would quite like junior apprenticeships and C6 and 7 year olds go on work experience, apart from the health and safety people who collapsed in a corner, everybody laughed and everybody applauded it. And when we talk to the people we work with, we've got lots of companies in there from BA and whatever else, and, and globally there's a big piece on this. This is kind of the picture that we're given. And then they're quite interesting things. Like then somebody said to me, we need to teach resilience. Uh, how do you do that then? Friday afternoon, 2 o'clock, resilience on the curriculum. Or do you provide opportunities for children to experience and find their path to levels of resilience? One of the greatest things that I found in, in our activities is talking to you, finding youngsters who are not enjoying what they're doing. One boy was an estate agent, he was measuring up, and I said, you look really bored, and he said, I am. I said, well, why are you doing it then? Why don't you just stop? You can, you know, you can make your own decisions. And, if you th and then his answer was, I'm not allowed to do that in school. And it's kind of quite interesting, isn't it, what, where we're positioning our youngsters in terms of their independence and their decision making. We've done some research. We took 61,000 children with Havashelia and we analysed what their first choices were. Children can only aspire to what they know exists. So if you come from a council estate in the north and you're a nine-year-old girl, there's an 85% chance that the supermarket will be your first activity. If you are from London, there's a greater chance that the, that the jobs you choose are service industry related. If you come from outside London, it's a, you choose jobs that are about making things. I'll use the aeroplane as an example. Age four, the cabin crew activity is 70% girls, 30% boys. The pilot activity is 70% boys, 30% girls. That's age four. So what on earth has happened in those first four years? 
Age 14, those statistics are the same. Let's not kid ourselves. Those statistics remain 70-30, exactly the same. So sometimes I think as grown-ups and academics in our offices, we talk about successes, and when we check back with significant number of youngsters, we find that they don't exist. We're going to repeat this exercise globally across the other 20, 23 Kinsanias within the next 12 months, and we will be touring nationally with BET, where we presented this, uh, to put together recommendations for government in terms of bringing, two minutes, thank you, in terms of bringing um, the whole piece into some recommendations. These are the things we found. There's no surprises. I think the surprise is we've now got the data to back it and we've got, we can back what we want to do. And that's a dialogue we need to have. That's a dialogue we all need to have, every educator, including parents. This is what we believe, and that is what we try in, a, in our small contribution, because that's what it is, that's what we try to achieve. If we got to the point where every child is confident enough to write the narrative of the possible for themselves, we would be a damn size better off. But we need to start that ten years younger than we are at the moment. And hopefully then at some point somebody will say this and not just the eleven year old designer from Sheffield. That's it. Brilliant, thanks very much.